Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this evening, where our guest is Jeremy Scott, Reverend Jeremy Scott, who is the pastor, uh, United Methodist pastor in Johnstown, Colorado, yay, Colorado. Uh, Jeremy, at one, one point, served in the same capacity that I serve here in this conference, in the Mountain Sky Conference. He's the author of two books, Rotten Hobby, which um, we won't talk about tonight, but you ought to learn a little bit about it. It's an interesting story. If you want to share it, you can, Jeremy, absolutely. And also the book, Witness Your Why, which is the purpose of our gathering. Uh, I've known Jerry, Jeremy for several years, both Kim and I have. He has an incredible knack for helping, especially small and medium-sized churches, to rediscover, um, to rediscover why they do what they do and how to do it better. And through his help and resources, he's enabled uh, churches to find new healthy ways of being church in their local communities. And um, we're gonna tap into that wealth of knowledge. And like all of us, Jeremy has also been leaning forward, reimagining and rethinking what it means to be church in a COVID world, and especially moving into a post COVID world. Um, tonight, as you have questions, we're gonna keep a pretty quick pace since this is an hour, but as you have questions, uh, you can use either the chat feature at the bottom of the screen or the Q and A and Diane Kaneski, who is uh, the chair of the Equipping Vital Congregations team for our conference, and Cindy Weaver, who is uh, uh, administrative uh, leader of the Equipping Vital Congregations office, are both staffing those two areas. Um, so again, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, Jerry, Jeremy, welcome to this Husqvarna conference. Thank you. It's, it's nice to have you here. Joining us. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is great. This is a good reason to be on Zoom. It is a good reason yeah. to be on Zoom. You didn't have to leave your house. I didn't. You didn't have to buy an airline ticket. This is awesome. It's amazing. But we also can't feed you the incredible food that comes out of central Pennsylvania either. That's true. And that, that that's a good part of most of the travel, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So th thanks for letting me be here, Gary. Appreciate this. Um, I do... Um, I hope that we can make this at least somewhat converse, conversational. So please, as questions come up or comments or whatever, put them in the chat. I'm sure somebody will let me know um, why you're why we're there why you're there. Um, Absolutely. As Gary shared, um, I've been uh, blessed to be uh, a local church in local church ministry for a while now. It's actually a second career for me. I was a software engineer uh, for a number of years uh, before um, discerning a call into something else and. Um, have had the chance to serve small churches and churches um, started off with a couple small churches in Ohio, uh, served churches in Montana, um, now serving in Colorado. And then also, as, as Gary said, four years on the uh, uh, in the Mountain Sky Conference and leadership there um, doing new church starts and existing church vitality. Um, and it was while I was there uh, doing that work that I, I decided that, you know, some of the stuff that I was learning that I had learned from my own experience, um, but also what I was learning working with some amazing church planters um, about uh, what they were learning on the ground about how you bring um, the good news to new, new people kind of led me to wanting to write, um, frankly, a very approachable, theologically moderate and mainstream book on evangelism in a way to almost sort of reclaim that word. Um, to some degree, and I'm not sure how successful I was in that part of it. Um, that may be the word may be a little beyond saving for some people, but I do think as people of faith, we're called to, to share the good news. Uh, we respect everyone's right to make their own choices about faith and, um, and, and how they choose to pursue their own spiritual journeys. Um, but I also, I, I tell my church, I tell everyone I, I, I can, it's also like people can't make a choice if they don't know what they're choosing. Um, so yeah. for me, the, the whole idea of evangelism, the idea of witness, what does that look like? It's, it's, it's putting, um, putting our faith into uh, things that people can see and touch and taste and smell. Um, it's, it's giving us a way to talk about ourselves and our experience of God, our experience of the Holy Spirit, our experience of Jesus um, in, in a way that is relatable to people who maybe don't know what we mean when we say those things or um, maybe have a, a particular experience of the church that wasn't healthy or wasn't good. Um, and and in some ways they, they need those, that, that language uh, reclaimed or reframed for them. Um, so this idea of, of, of taking um, our faith and our experience of faith um, out of 
simply words and ideas and moving it into the world of actions and deeds and how we relate to the world and how we relate as people of faith and how we talk about our faith, not just in relationship of, you know, theological concepts, but our faith in relationship with how it is we're actually living on a practical day to day level, both as individuals and as a community, as as a church. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes what I've experienced is, is what we understand as evangelism is more of a translation issue than anything else. It's it's learning to translate what we do um, in a way that that um, frankly takes it out of the language that sometimes we're very comfortable with and into the language the world knows. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the concept of, of witnessing and, and what does that mean? Um, you know, kind of came from all of that. Uh, and and it's, been, it's been a fun process and it's been really great the last three years to be back in a local church and get to put the stuff into practice in a way um, and, and frankly find out that it, it works or at least it works here. Um, so that's part of what we'll talk about today. I'll talk about a couple things we've learned yeah. both pre-pandemic and then frankly, Gary, I actually really appreciate this invitation because your invitation to do this is the first time I've really got to think about the concept presented in this book, looking through the lens of the COVID pandemic and what that has changed for us. I think, you know, I, I in, in, in my context, it's something that we've been trying to live anyway. So it's, it's, but I haven't had the opportunity to really sit back and go, oh, like, how are we translating this to the world we're finding ourselves in now and the world that we're probably moving into next? Um, so thank you for letting me do this because it's caused me to like really think through like, oh, like we live in a different time now. We live. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I'll let, I'll let you know where you can send part of the part of the royalties when you write the second book. As oh. that. One of the things yeah, that, the that I appreciate about your book and the, and the pastors and lay people that I talk about who have been reading it is how practical it is and how grounded it is in, in the real world. It's it's not just so heavily theoretical. It didn't come from an ivory tower somewhere. It came from your experience. I love the when you told me that you wrote this book mainly in food courts, which means that you were in a place, right, where people were mingling and you got to observe behavior. And, and now you're back in the church doing it again. So you are you are a great practitioner, practical theologian in that regard. What does it mean? So help us to understand what it means to witness our why to to practice this kind of evangelism in such a time as this. That's, that is, that is a great question. Um, yes, I, I did write most of it in mall food courts back when that was a thing. Um, and then, and God help us will be a thing again. Um, what I have really figured out over the last, you know, over the last few months here and other places is I, I think COVID in many ways has been a stress test for the church. Um, and, you know, I, I've actually had some some heart thing go on and so they 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 put me on the treadmill for the stress test and if you haven't had one what they do is they load you up with all these sensors and they put you on treadmill and they make you work really hard to, to basically see if anything goes wrong right um you know and because they don't they can't really just they don't know just listening to your heart is this you know thing because it's some problems only show up um when it's under stress and frankly some strengths only show up when it was under stress and my test thankfully came back to say you have a very strong heart which is kind of what you want to hear um and I think that's what we've all been living through um, in a lot of ways is a stress test for the life of the church. Um, and, and we're hopefully finding those places where our congregations and our commu faith communities are strong, right? Those places where, you know, we're seeing um, some health or some strength come out that maybe we haven't seen before. We're seeing people step up um, into leadership that maybe haven't done it before. Uh, we're seeing people hopefully let go of some baggage that, Frankly, some of us maybe had hoped they would let go of a long time ago um, and, and just let those things go. Um, on the other side, unfortunately, I think we're also finding those places where, um, you know, maybe we're not as developed as we want to be and the strength isn't there um, as much as we want to be. Um, so in this question of, I think the question that most churches need to grapple with, and that comes up pretty strongly in the book, is this idea of your why. Like, why is your church there? Um, and And I think the our practical why, like the, the why, our functional why, the why that we've been living in maybe uh, without being very intentional about it um, is, are probably demonstrated in the things that we strived to keep doing, mm -hmm. even, you know, even, be, even when COVID changed everything. Um, so I think through like, what, what did we absolutely have to keep doing? Um, 
And, and why did we feel like we absolutely had to keep doing those things? Um, and was the reason we felt we absolutely had to keep doing those things in some way or another, were those discipleship reasons? Were those faith development reasons or were they preference driven? Were they because my people want or expect us to do this? And I think the things that come out of that that were discipleship driven, we need to go, oh, like that's that's part of who we are. Um, you know, that's important. We need to keep doing that um, even as things should hopefully shift back. Um, but maybe we need to look again at those things that were maybe more preference driven. So uh, so I think, you know, we, we get this wonderful chance to really see like where our strengths and weaknesses are, where, we're, what, you know, by what we, you know, what we, what we or others in our congregation like desperately held on to. Wow. Um, and, and so I want to, I'm going to share my screen actually, um, sure. just to, mm -hmm. well, let me see, how do I do this? <laughs> You're a software well, I want, developer. <laughs> I know, and I've never done it this way before because I only want to share part of my screen. So let's see if that works. There you go. All right. So let's see. Aha. So hopefully you guys are seeing some pictures there. Yes, we, we got them. So most like most of us, we ended up in the situation where, I mean, there were certain things that, that were just, to, we needed to continue to worship, right? In some way or somehow. Um, and, and that was sort of a given for all of us because we're Protestants, we don't know how to not worship, right? And, and, and I kind of take that as a given that we all strive to do that and do that well, um, because worship is and will, you know, continue to be in one form or another part of the primary discipleship expression in the life of the church. Um, so, but what was interesting for me is to see what things also had to continue to happen that, that people insisted, um, continue to happen within, within the life of our church. Um, and, and looking back on those that were more like discipleship related, I think of, you know, our, our, our VBS, that there was a lot of insistence that we could find a way to do a VBS, even though at that point we were in pretty heavy lockdown around here. So that was like 80 kids on zoom and everybody was scared to death. Like, how is this even going to work? Is this going to work? Can we make this work? I don't know. Um, but again, it was one of those places where we found some strength that we didn't know we had. People rolled up their sleeves. They thought differently about things. Um, and, and obviously, that just sort of cemented for me that, that, that you know, kids and helping kids in their spiritual and faith journey, we kind of knew was part of who we were, but it really showed itself as this is part of who we are. Um, like, this, this, is, this is a strength of ours, and we need to see that, and we need to celebrate it. Um, the other thing and that kind of the other picture in the bottom corner of the people around tables um, is uh, we had a umcore relationship here where we like to build kits. Um, but we recognize that, you know, there were there was needs in our own community. So that team got together and said, OK, we're not going to do umcore kits, but we're going to call the food bank and we're going to see what they need and what hygiene products people need and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to organize and we're going to make that happen. Um, and so that became you know, a, a strong part, uh, surface is a strong part of who we are. Um, and then finally we got to Christmas and of course, you know, you're gonna have a Christmas Eve service, whatever you can do it or whatever, but there was this strong sense that we, we want to do something for the community that we can do that, you know, bring some hope to this season. Like it just, it feels like such a melancholy Christmas this year. Um, how do we bring hope? What do we, what do we know how to do now? Six months into COVID? Well, we know how to live stream. That's what we know how to do. We have musicians. What if we put on, you know, a, you know, a, a live stream concert for the community? We involve community people in it. All the in-person community concerts are shut down. Nobody in town really knows how to do it any other way. We do know how to do that. Can that be a gift we give the community? Um, you know, stay in on a sat Friday night, be with the family, hear some good music, hear a good message, um, you know, and all those sorts of things. So that sense of wanting to be a place of hope for the community you know, in and, and a place that offers hope into the community, um, you know, becomes, you know, part of, of, of who we are. So I think what, as far as like, what is witnessing our why in this time means is, I think it means looking to those places where um, we have that alignment, you know, that kind of Venn diagram overlap between things, th things that we can do and, and are able to do and want to do and feel, you know, striving to, you know, we feel compelled to do that also overlap with some understanding of how we understand discipleship in this place. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and how do we center those and put those in front of folks and make sure people find a, even in new and different ways to find a way to, to do that um, is, is one of those things that we do. And I hope that's the lesson we can all take from this time is, is to really use this as, as honestly, K Woods almost like a diagnostic tool for our, our churches um, to really figure out where our strengths and weaknesses are. And to be honest about it, we yeah. found a lot of stuff that wasn't pretty, right? Like we found a lot of stuff like, we need to stop doing that. Like that just, that's not good for us. Like that's, that's not healthy. I'm trying to struggle to think of an example right now, but I mean, there was plenty that we just, yeah, we, we laugh yeah. now. We're like, we're, that's never coming back. <laughs> You know, as you're talking about about this, the um, you know, thinking of the obstacles that get in the way, I think I love this stress test metaphor. I think what it did is it uncovered the core values of our congregations, and it, and it and it's the stark reality of of going, oh my gosh, this is what we have valued all this time, but is it what we really value? Because I'm looking at these pictures and I see valuing community, valuing serving others valuing um, creating a space for worship outside of our building for those who are not yet here and values guiding then those behaviors and and i love what you're saying I, hopefully some of the stuff that got stripped away were the things that that didn't line up with with really our core values and we we were able to see that for the first time maybe and going oh my gosh yeah we don't need to do that anymore right are there any other yeah. obstacles that obstacles that you see that get in the way of this well, I mean, I think there's, well, I, I, you said something important there, Gary, and you, actually you just modeled something important there, which is my, my, my congregations, they, they, they wanted to do these things. They wanted to do VBS partly because we love VBS and it makes us happy, right? <laughs> um, and, but they felt this call to do it. They felt this call, that there was something inside of them that wanted to serve the community by reframing on course. So they, I don't know that my people themselves would have really, drawn the connection between that and you know an intentional act of discipleship i think that 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 fell to me as the leader so i love what you just did there gary because you just reframed you know what was happening in terms of values and in terms of these higher commitments to who we are as a people and how we are as a people of faith mm -hmm. um so oftentimes what i found in my role in this last year has been is to just basically help people and help reframe things that probably were already happening or things we were having to do in a different way and remind people of why we were doing this and how this was an expression of our faith and how this was expression of our calling to go forth and make disciples, however you want to think about it. Um, you know, they weren't going to bring that language, but I could bring that to them. And everybody went, oh, okay. Like, and then suddenly you also give them permission to feel good about what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I think sometimes we like, don't give people permission to actually like feel good about the good that they're doing in the world. And I'm like, look, you're not just, you're not doing this selfishly just because it's because of you, you're doing it to be the hands and feet of Christ. Like you, you should take joy in this because God takes joy um, in the fact that you're doing this. Um, and so the gift that I try to give people is just to reframe what they're doing. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, the concert was, we, we could do it and we knew how to do it and it sounded fun. I think that's kind of where for some people that's where it started. And I'm like, no, this is a gift of hope, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. is a, this is a, this is an island of hope and some normalcy in a very abnormal time. Like this is a gift of grace um, to people. Uh, and, and and even though it's just lining people up to sing, um, it's 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 that, but it's also this. Um, so I think I think one of the biggest obstacles is our own imagination and our own ability to sort of reframe and rethink about what we're doing, not just technically like, okay, I got a stream, so I'm gonna use my phone or whatever, um, but also to reframe it in our minds of, oh, this is the gift we're giving through this mm -hmm. um, behind it. And, and if we can do that, then, then, then you get to watch the light bulbs go off. And that is a huge, huge moment. For that is such a, that's such a cool thing to see that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and it honors people when you're able to say, this is, what, this is what we've been talking about. This is what we've been preaching about. Um, so one of the things that, that, you know, that I like about your book um, and just this teaching that you have, is this interplay or this relationship between discipleship and membership, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the opportunities that we have, and you're really, now you are ready to write something about COVID-19 in your, in your next iteration of this, because it That's is- right, an, an extra chapter or something. Yeah, it is the stress test and it's, and it's revealing a lot, but I think it's also revealing, isn't it? This, the, diff, the dynamic difference 
between membership and discipleship. Can you talk about right. that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think for a, a lot of us, it's it's getting some language together. Um, again, I think, and oftentimes this is a language issue more than anything uh, about what it is we mean when we say um, discipleship, because discipleship can mean nothing or everything, and it can mean whatever you want it to mean if you don't have some kind of things behind it. Um, so one of the things that we actually did pre-pandemic that we'd worked on in a while um, is kind of a, we had we had a, a, kind of an organic process. I don't know that my people even knew they were going through a process, even though I knew they were because I was leading them through it. Um, about finding our language around how we understood discipleship, um, and a lot of that involved, um, you know, a, a really what ended up kind of being a process of active listening between me and uh, you know me and a couple of my leaders and the congregation as a whole. Uh, which is basically we would say things and wait to hear what we heard back, right? Like, you know, and we would throw out concepts or ideas or phrasing or whatever and wait to see what people responded with and, and where we started to see those out in the world um, and where people kind of latched on to various language. And it was a long, it took like probably, it was probably about a year. And, you know, um, and so we would just start to repeat things until we heard them repeated back to us. And they were like, okay, we're on to something here. Um, which is where we got the, the pictures you see now are the, there's three there's three banners that hang in the back of our sanctuary, um, and we kind of refer to, refer to them as our three phrases, and they're a little awkward and they're not as kitchen you know they're not as clever as maybe we'd like them to be, but they work for us. Um, they're practical and we're a pragmatic bunch around here, um, and these are our three phrases. And and so when kind of COVID kind of came in the world and we started to have to make some hard choices about where we were going to invest time and what we were not going to invest time and what we were going to resurrect and what we were going to reframe and reinvent and what we were not going to reframe and reinvent and what we were like go of. One of the kind of like diagnostic questions for the stress test we were undergoing was can we relate this thing that we're wanting to do, are doing or rethinking to one of these free phrases? Does it help us love God, love neighbor or love ourselves? Does it, um, you know, does it help us people understand that they're loved just the way they are and they're challenged to become more? Is what we're doing challenging people to become more than what they are? Is it affirming that they are loved just as they are? Um, you know, and the last one is actually the one people love more than anything, which is, you know, we recognize we can't do everything, so we're doing something, right? So, and and for us, the from the diagnostic side is like, are we taking on something that we can actually do something about? Or are we, you know, tilting at windmills for issues that are you know, beyond the scope of our, you know, church of 150 people, um, you know, are, are we taking on something that's either too big or too small for us? I mean, are we, are we finding this, are, are we in the universe of these large issues that we're dealing with? And we're dealing with a lot of large issues, not just COVID, but race relations and poverty and all these things. Like, I don't know how to fix racism in this country. I wish I do. I don't know how to do that. Do I know how to help my church be conscious of that is an issue that, you know, of maybe a little more conscious of our own privileges, that, yes, that is probably something I can do. Um, you know, I can't fix COVID, but can I keep people safe? Um, you know, those sorts of things. So these kind of became, these already existed in a way in our church and they were centered to a point, but they kind of came the diagnostic questions of our stress test, like I said, like, how do we know if we're doing the right thing or if this isn't fitting with what we're supposed to be doing? Like, well, can you relate it to this? Um, you know, is this about helping people love God, love neighbor and love themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, or is it about getting together just to complain about how terrible the world is? Because mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's not, mm -hmm. it might feel good in the short term, but I don't think that's doing something. I don't think that's helping people become more. I don't think it's about loving anybody. Um, so, so I think that, you know, and for us, that became kind of the thing around we built this on. And so it just became, it just kind of flows from there that, you know, you, you, you can't love God if you're not spending time with God. You can't love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor. Um, you can't love yourself if you're not spending time with yourself. Um, and though for, for my congregation that has a lot of, you know, people who kind of at previously kind of lived in this community, but commuted to other communities to work and, you know, spending time with themselves used to be a problem. It wasn't a problem for a while there. Everybody was spending plenty of time with themselves. Um, so, so the question then became, and I think the other thing that people realized is, you know, they missed, they missed church, right? They missed the community aspects of the church. And so that also gave us a chance to kind of reframe that to folks like, well, what do you actually miss in this? Like, what do you miss in these uh, relationships? Because 
um, you know, we've all been dealing with this, right? I mean, this has been, you know, our, yeah. you know, a, you know, Cameron Empty Sanctuary. Like, um, what do you really miss about this? And when we dug into that a little bit, what we realized is people missed feeling seen, they missed feeling heard, and they kind of missed feel, feeling known, right? And and so if we're going to you know, if we're going to, how, how do we provide opportunities for people to feel seen, heard, and known, um, you know, that, that, and, and what does that look like both during the pandemic, which required very interesting tools to do that when you couldn't physically put people together. But I think those questions are going to follow us after this, because when, when we have guests, when we have visitors, you know, when we encounter people in the community, whatever it is, how do we help them feel those things? Because that's what they need to feel. Yeah. Um, so our biggest tool for this um, actually became, now I don't, I don't know where you all are in your conference on your communion theology. So if this is heresy to you, I apologize. Um, but we undertook this practice um, the Saturday before the first Sunday of the month where we literally drove to every household and dropped off wafers and juice, you know, in little like shot glasses of juice and and, and wafers um, to to everybody um, so that we could take communion together, even though we all weren't physically together. And it's, that's theological anathema to you, I apologize, but out here in the West, we're just a bunch of heathens anyway. Um, so, um, but, and then we realized, well, if we're gonna do that, the first Sunday we did, it happened to be Palm Sunday anyway, like, well, we gotta send the palm branches home. Um, and then it became this thing of, um, and then we, 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 you know, we gave drivers little routes of people in their community um, you know, because it would be convenient for them to drive to. Well, what's the side product of this is? Well, people started to like talk to each other like on their patios, right? And and people started to like call people and say, hey, I'm dropping off this stuff. And, you know, friendships were formed and, and that that little, we, we started to call it our box of grace, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is the box of grace that we're, we're dropping off every month. And we started like, okay, so it can't just be communion now. It's got to be communion and we'll send the newsletter too. And then, but we got to send something that has to do with what we're doing. So we sent like, little games and puzzles and got all super creative with them. It was super fun. Uh, we're actually, the, we're, we're ending it in March because we're moving on, or May, May's our last month and I'm gonna miss it. Um, uh, but it became that way that we actually had some sort of touch with every household in our, in our church um, that we sort of just stumbled into, but we realized that that was something that people were, especially our most, our older people lived alone, you know, those folks, newer people who were new to the church, the fact that we showed up, right? That somebody showed up once a month and kept showing up each month to drop off something physically at their house. Um, talk about feeling known, being, be, feeling like you're being seen, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and so that actually became a really interesting expression um, of, of this whole process. So, so when we say, well, we just like to get together now, I think we have a deeper understanding now of what, what we mean when we say that. And then we also know, well, this is what we want people to have, right? Like this is when we say, oh, our church is like family. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think we kind of now have a better understanding of mm -hmm. what that means in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about evangelism moving from membership, right? I'm, I claim this place and, um, you know, I claim to be part of membership really is I claim to be part of this place, right? That's, that's membership, right? I think relationship means this place claims me. Right. And so how do we help people feel claimed by us? Right. And it starts with like, we know your name. <laughs> right. We could we send you an email on your birthday, like simple stuff like that. But you know, a box that shows up once a month on your doorstep, um, a communion, a Sunday school kit dropped off to your kid, you know, twice a month. Um, you know, somebody checking in on you, um, you know, uh, with just a phone call or whatever. Um, how do we help people feel? not just like they're invited to be part of us, but that we we want them to be part of us, that 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 we are, this isn't just them claiming us, we are claiming them as, I use that language all the time, like, was well, that person a member? And I'm like, well, we claim them. I'm not sure if they're an actual <laughs> member and I'm not sure I care. Um, but if somebody asked if they were mine, I'd be like, yeah, that sheep's in my flock. Um, and, and we want people to feel that way. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? How, what can we do to help people feel that way? Mm -hmm. And so that's our question now is like, okay, we're not going to drop this off every month because it's not going to be the same thing because we are moving to the place where more people are in person. So how are we going to give people that same opportunity 
to feel known and cared for by us, to feel claimed by us. Um, as we go back to, you know, as we no longer need to do these things. Sure. Um, and, and I think it's going to involve that extra step and that extra work that maybe we haven't done as much of before. Yeah. And helping and helping the members, the claimed to claim their neighbors, to claim their yeah. neighborhood. Uh, it's that parish model that we, we claim the people who live around us in our communities as already being a part of this household of faith. They may not know that yet. It might not mean anything to them yet, but we're going to treat them as though it is true. Um, so we have a question from yes. the chat. Yes. Um, Jeremy, you mentioned earlier <laughs> about a small church and you have mentioned attendance of 150. So the question is, when you say small church, what's the average worship do you mean for that? They, they're oh, looking... oh, so I, I mean, I started in, uh, I started with 11 on an average Sunday. Um, so that, that was my beginnings. Um, I mean, no, I think in our part of the world, um, I, I would, Gary, when you were describing the dynamics of where you are, I think ours are very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, at 150, I, I'd say our average attendance right now at our church is 160, which is enough in this place to make me a, a, a solid medium sized. Um, so, you know, we would probably have a similar understanding of, Mm -hmm. You know, smaller churches in our area are 100 or less, if not 50 or less. Uh, we have tons of those. I've worked with tons of those. Um, and and I think, you know, one of the advantages that I'm learning is, yeah, this is a conversation we've actually had around our church recently about where do we want to go from here? Um, uh, because there's a fear that if we get any bigger than where we're going to get, the ability for us to claim people and maintain the relationships in the way that we do are going to be seriously degraded. I mean, there's been tons of sociological studies that say 150 people is about the max that most communities can maintain and be a community. Um, you know, and, and if you get much beyond that, you're talking about multiple communities living under the same roof in some way. And whether it's because if it's either people who attend different worship services or whatever it is. Right. Um, but there's a reason the 200 barrier in church is so hard to cross. Um, I, what I find interesting is a lot of the stuff that we've come to rely on during COVID would probably be easier to do in a lot of ways in smaller churches. I mean, if you're a church of 50 people, then you're probably talking 20, 25 households. It's a lot easier to develop, to, you know, drop off boxes of community at 25 households than it is 100 households. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the relational aspect of it is, is even stronger there, um, you know, and, and, and in some ways easier to, to facilitate um, in those small stuff. So, you know, I, we don't, tr we don't tend, I, I prefer to not rely on things that, um, you know, require a lot of resources um, or money being spent. I would much rather deploy people, um, you know, and, and, um, you know, we all have, we all have people to deploy. You've got 25 people in your church. You've got 25 people to deploy um, in one way or another, um, you know, and I, I don't know if this may be, I, I don't think this is unique to our experiences, but we're also coming at a time where I have a lot of folks that really want to feel useful. That one thing that COVID has taken away from a lot of people is, you know, the ways in which they used to feel useful. They can't babysit their grandkids. They can't, you know, volunteer at the library. They can't, you know, you know, all the things that they did to, you know, feel useful and beneficial to others. Many of those were taken away from folks. So, you know, we had, I've had folks like come to me and, you know, teary eyed because we let them fold paper for an hour. And I'm like, I just like, great. <laughs> like, I'm glad you could do that for us. Um, so, but I think the work also has to be meaningful. We have people understand, even if it's folding paper, why that folding that paper is meaningful. Um, so, um, you know, some of the most successful churches that I worked with um, when I was in Gary's role um, as far as people actually going out and making impacts and, and you know, um, being able to form new relations with our communities where our smaller churches, um, yeah. because the smaller churches get relational and the, the need for relationality better because <laughs> yeah. that's all they got. Yeah, we exactly. Have a, have a follow up question about the communion drop offs. How did you mm -hmm. then do communion with those households? Yeah. Oh, did you um. So we, I mean, so we dropped off, um, so we basically dropped off like, you know, it was like, they were like wafers, you know, like the little 
Catholic, almost Catholic wafers you can buy. Uh, Cokesbury will sell them to you. Um, yeah. You know, and little uh, one ounce glasses of juice. Um, we called the health department. We did it all by the rules. Um, you know, and and so I would I prayed over all of it. It all basically was set out um, to be delivered, and I prayed over all of it um, uh, before it was um, delivered, and then we would. Um, you know, do our communion liturgy on our live stream and invite people to participate as they would as if they were sitting with us. Um, and then we invited them if they were, if they were in a family situation, we invited them to serve each other um, or if they were by themselves, serve themselves. I know for some that is not theologically. That's, that's been, that's we, been a, we, we had, a, we got a blessing from our bishop to do it. Yeah, that's been a pretty consistent practice here. I, yeah, so, so I think the thing for us is we wanted to, um, you know, was that that making time, you know, and um, making time in the services we normally would. It was this little splash of normalcy, mm -hmm. you know, in it, and and the intentional invitation to if you're in a if you're together as a family or something to serve each other. Right, Cindy, do you have a question in your area? I see. I do. Have, okay. I, I, <clears throat> I do have a question, um, Jeremy. When you were speaking about conversations on the porches as you dropped off the box of grace. Have you considered house churches for smaller groups? And if so, have they been successful with COVID restrictions? Um, we, we have, we started down that path. Um, we did not, um, it was not somewhere we pursued. I will tell you that um, I am aware of about um, a half dozen churches, including three of my former new church starts that I keep tabs on. Um, that all tried some version of that with limited success. Um, and what I'm hearing from people who are doing those brave experiments um, is the thing that um, seems to be working better is our, the, the challenge there seems to be the frequency. Um, weekly small group gatherings for people who aren't used to doing that seems to be a barrier. Um, so yeah, I think we all kind of had this vision of like, well, if people in the same neighborhood could gather together and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, we, we in our part of the world um, started to look more at uh, other opportunities outside of uh, worship to gather people in local groups, um, in, in small groups um, on more like a monthly basis. And that has been not only here, but in other places I'm hearing more successful. Cindy, do you, did you have another question in your, in your room? I just have one that was related to the three banners that you uh, had up there earlier, uh, Jeremy. Uh, mm -hmm. What, is there a format you use that has it to three words? No, I, you know, I, I wish, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, as far as like one word for each one of these, um, we, we never quite got as piffy as I wanted to with it. And, and part of that is the work was, we were in process with it when COVID hit and then it kind of got, and then, and now it's just, we're living with the awkwardness of it, you know, they're being a little more verbose than maybe we'd want them to be. So no, we never really got there. Um, what, what we did instead is we started to um, embrace them. So like I'm, we, 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 we did bracelets with all three phrases on them. Um, the first one, the, you know your OG in our congregation if you have the light blue original, because not everybody has that, because that's from like two years ago. Um, and then the other two actually went out as sort of um, what well, we affectionately started to call um, communion prizes, like Cracker Jack prizes. Um, <laughs> they went out as communion prizes with communion uh, to folks. And what's interesting is uh, this is one of those places I found interesting. I didn't believe it. This is one of those things that more of my men will engage in. Um, I actually see more of the men in my church wearing the wristbands than I do others. Um, but we started to use them those places, um, and. And they are frequently brought up in like sermons and, and, and things like that. I do try to, you know, reinforce them, you know, in various ways that way. So, but no, we never got like down to super piffy with it. <laughs> okay. I'd so like to. I have another follow-up for that one. What's the diplomacy that you use to convince the leadership that maybe their preferences were part of the barrier and change was necessary 
How did you bring them along in that process? And then another question then relates it to how do you propose to not only deal with the local church, but then at the next level with those jurisdictionaries to make them realize there's other ways to measure vitality? Ah, uh, good question. No, the vitality measure question. I wrestled with that when I was in Gary's job, and I'm glad it's oh, not my yeah. job anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so let me, let me, I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing that for a while. Um, so to the first question, the leadership. Um, one of the things that um, as a as whether you are a uh, clergy leader or a lay leader or however whatever leadership position you're in church, everybody always has the right to ask questions, um, and and so. For me, it was it was a long it was you know it, this, these processes take time, um, but once we sort of had established again the phrasing, um, you know especially I mean I think for most of my congregation the one that they most latch on to um, is you know we help people learn to love God, love neighbor, and love ourselves. Um, so then the question becomes when either ideas or questions about existing ministries continuing or not continuing or just doing, you know, a standard, you know, just kind of looking around is that the question becomes is like, well, how does this help um, us do this well? How does this help us, you know, help people love God, love neighbor, love themselves? Um, and and so, you know, I the, the best way to do it is to kind of at least get people there themselves, uh, because my experience has been few things are not are completely unredeemable, right? I mean, there are some ways in which, um, you know, existing ministries that maybe don't have much to do with discipleship, don't have much to do with these sort of things, can be made to have more to do with these things if they are approached in an intentional way. Um, and sometimes it's easier to um, rebuild than it is to build strictly new um, within the life of these. And I would say, I don't know, maybe half the time, maybe a little bit more, um, once people get into that mode of asking questions, it becomes, it becomes exciting because you're like, you know, there, there's a, again, there's a permission element to, you know, to, you mean, we don't have to do it the way we've always done it. Like, no, not if it's not serving us. Like what, what are our goals here? Like how, why are we doing this? Um, so I, I tend to deploy a lot of, you know, very, you know, uh, point to, you know, questioning by, you know, you know, uh, change through questioning why we do what we do um, in a loving way. And, 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 and in a way that, you know, kind of relates back to this thing we've all, we've already all agreed is important. Like we've already all agreed, the leadership has agreed that these living into these statements is important to this church. Um, so then the question shifts to, should we do this? Should we not do it? it this question then shifts to, and the conversation shifts to, how does this help us do this? How does this help us reach, live into this why? Um, and can it be, can it do so? Um, and, and again, I think the gift of COVID was we didn't have a choice, but to question a lot of these things and, and say, and ask the question, well, what are we really trying to accomplish here? Mm -hmm. Right? Like we can come, come up with some way to do a lousy version of something before, but why? Like what, what is, what is the outcome? What are we trying to accomplish? What does it have to do with our why? Um, and that, and then the permission to give that. And I hope that's not, I, I hope that's an opportunity that folks have taken advantage because I don't, I'm hopefully, God help us, we're not going to have another pandemic. You know? I hope not. Hope we don't have to I've got a question that I want to ask. And I know there are some, there are some questions in our chat room and all that. And I, we want to save time before mm -hmm. seven. We're, we're about uh, 6.45 here. So there's about yeah, I just saw that. Ooh. 15 minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. But I think this question gets at maybe some of the questions that are, that are already waiting and if not, we're going we're gonna to find some time for that. But what insights can you share with us about how to engage others in witnessing their why as part of their faith and discipleship? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think now and then as we move towards being able to gather and some of these, I mean, you know, we are going to arrive at a point that restrictions are going to go away. Um, I think one of the things that we've done is... Um, okay. One is starting from a place of, you know, um, of hopefulness, you know, starting of a, from a place of, of joy, starting from a place of celebration. Um, you know, people are going to, to, to share what they're excited about. That's just human nature, um, right? Um, so I think really the first thing to do is to help people understand that a lot of what we're doing 
is an expression of discipleship, even if we don't understand it to be such. Like, we don't go to the food pantry just because we're nice people. Like, yes, we're nice people, but it's not the only reason we're down there, right? I mean, we do have this, you know, this calling, this greater calling as people of faith um, to serve in that way. Um, and so, you know, half the time, it's just first about naming that and celebrating it for people, um, for them, so that they can hopefully learn how to do it themselves. Um, so that when they're talking about these things, they understand they have permission um, because people don't want, we're, we're all so demure in the church. I mean, we're also like, well, yeah, you know, I went to the food pantry and had, you know, you know and I'm not, don't, I understand we don't want to brag when that there's a difference, but there's also this passage about this guy named Jesus about hiding your bushel, you know, light, light under a bushel. We're very, very good at that. Um, you know, so especially, and I think it's also helpful to help people understand and really celebrate the things that we do collectively, right? Because while Jesus had a problem with people, you know, really bragging about their individual accomplishments, as a group, he was very clear he wanted us to share our joy as a group. Um, so I think giving people permission and modeling what that looks like and, and both celebrating them when they do that work and show them how to do that is, fine, is part of it. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, we, we have to, you know, most of us do try to engage in activities that are, you know, more targeted to those outside the church, right? That, you know, we, we do something because we want to do something that's, you know, more, um, that, that may be more interesting to people who are outside the church and all that stuff. I'm good with that. And I think we need to do those things. But I think even when we engage in those things, they need to be at least discipleship adjacent, right? I mean, you know, they, they need to be at least, you know, within, you know, a, a half step of something that, you know, is, you know, related to who we are as, you know, uh, a faith community. So one of the examples from the pre-COVID days um, for us was we partnered with a local coffee shop and we got them to stay open early or late um, in Christmas time. And we, we, we came down and we brought our sound system and our everything and said, we're going to, we're going to come you know, lead people in, you know, Christmas carol karaoke, right? We're going to come, we'll, we'll bring all the stuff. People love to sing Christmas carols. It's that time of year. We're going to come down and we're going to, you know, lead a Christmas carol sing for, for you know, you and anybody in the community wants to come. And it, it ended up being about half the room was our church folks and about half the room was community folks who just thought it would be fun to come out and sing Christmas carols. Um, you know, and what did that do? Well, it gave us a chance. And yet, of course, we told the people we were going to do this. Like, we, I mean, we didn't have like an altar call or anything like that. Um, but we didn't hide the fact that we were the church and we didn't hide the fact we were going to have an Easter Sun or a Christmas Eve service where we were going to sing some more of these songs. Um, and, and we had told our folks, you need to meet somebody, you know, you need to, you know, get one name while you're there. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and, it, and since music ministry is part of who we are as a church and is something important to who we are, it is, you know, adjacent to, um, you know, who we are as a church. And so it's not, it's not completely separated from what we are. We did something similar around Easter with children's ministry and, you know, all that sort of stuff that, that we invited people to. So, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of doing activities and I think it's good for the church to do activities out in the community for the benefit of the community. Um, but I do think they need to be, it's, it's helpful if they are, if you want to use them as a witnessing opportunity then they at least have to be adjacent to discipleship, if not, you know, mm -hmm. how you understand discipleship happening in your church. And, mm -hmm. you know, providing a, a family-friendly opportunity for folks to go out and spend some time together, I would argue, is loving your neighbor. Um, you know, and, you know, but it's my responsibility as a leader to help my my congregation also see it that way so they can talk about it in that way when they meet people. Um, yeah. 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 Did, I answer, did I answer your question, Gary? Yeah, and I think it's. I just start telling stories, and then that. Well, what I see in that picture, and then we're going to go to questions, is connecting the dots. Because sometimes mm -hmm. we do these things, we don't we don't connect the dots back to our faith. We don't connect the dots back to Jesus. It's like a standalone mm -hmm. act of kindness, maybe even an act of mercy. But there's but there's yeah. where's the opportunity for us to be able to invite. Yeah. Um, right? yeah. And as leaders, we need to like we need to connect the dots for folks initially. Like we right. cannot rely on them. Like the, the, the idea of, well, they come to a Cub Scout meeting here. Why wouldn't they come to church here? And I'm like, right. do they know what church is? Has anybody invited them? Do they know why they should show up or why they should care? 
Right. You know, you are that building they go to Cub Scouts in. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. I did a, I did a seminar, a webinar um, a week ago on, um, on our preschool, we have a very strong preschool ministry and actually about a third to half of our growth in the last couple of years in our church has come at, at because of our preschool, um, you know, and relationships we've formed with outside parents and outside families, you know, through our preschool ministry. Um, and one of the big takeaways from that thing and that, that I realized in doing that is, you know, we, we had to go to them first right? We had to go to the preschool families first before they came to us. And again, it's that we had to claim them. We had to say, because you are a preschool family, you are part of the ministry of this church faith. Frankly, whether you want to be or not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not quite that aggressive, but you know, it's like, we claim you, we, by, and by that, we mean, we care about you. We care about your well-being. Uh, we care about the well-being of your, we're not just that place that teaches your kid the ABCs, right? Like we care about you in more ways than that. And we're going to demonstrate it you know, I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm going to show up. I read to those kids all the time. I love to do it. It's fun. But I also like them. They need to know who their pastor is, you know, whether because they don't have a pastor. As far as they're concerned, it's me. And when they see me in the grocery store, they're like, hey, there's the guy with the duck uh, puppet. So me and my puppet go read. Um, but, but that's what it's been. It's like we, and, and once we started doing that, once we went to them, started forming relationships with them, myself and other leaders in the church were intentional about doing that. And frankly, we claimed them as a part of our part of our congregation and part of our circle of care. Then, and only then, did we start to see them reciprocate and show up at events that weren't necessarily preschool related events. They start oh. showing up at VBS, they start showing up at Sunday school, they start showing up at some of these other places. Not right. all of them, right. but more than would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. Awesome, I, that, that, that's awesome. Great answers to those questions. I know we have a couple of other questions that are that are out here that we want to cover in our remaining time. And let's see, Cindy, I think there's some in Q and A. There is, yes, Jeremy. Um, one question: What advice would you offer to small churches just embarking on the witness your why journey? And what would you consider the first step forward? Oh, that is a really, really great question. Um, I would say a um, couple of things. One is find some things to celebrate, you know, um, and, and make sure you are celebrating them often. Uh, this is something I, I, I took from a mentor of mine at Church for All People in Columbus, Ohio, um, uh, the, the founding pastor there, great guy, uh, John Edgar. And um, he drilled this into our heads. Like, I don't care how small it is. I don't care what it is. You find something that church is doing well and you celebrate it and you help them understand um, why that you're celebrating this and why it's, you know, why it's discipleship related is what I would say, um, you know, and, and, and you, you just, it, it doesn't matter how small it is. You just, you start there. So you're starting with positive energy. You have to start with some positive energy. You have to start with some optimism. It is so easy to start from this by looking around going, we don't have any young people and we'd really like to have some. We'll start with what we don't have. We'll start with what we don't know. This is a build from your strengths process and you have to identify your strengths, even how minor they are, and you got to celebrate them and you got to celebrate them hard. Um, so I would do that. And then the other thing is I would, you know, engage in some intentional active listening in your congregation, even if they don't know you're doing it to them, it's probably better if they don't, um, where, you know, you, you know, ex you know, throw phrasing, throw ideas, throw out there and really pay attention and give yourself the opportunity to pay attention to um, what you're hearing back from them. Like what is sticking? Um, what are they latching onto as something they identify with? Um, I run a, a, a Thursday night, um, it's not, not a very big group, smaller group um, called my deeper dive group. And we basically dive deeper into whatever the scripture from the previous Sunday was. Part of the gift of that time is they will inevitably tell me whatever stuck with them from what it is we did on Sunday, whether that was a song or whether it was that part of the sermon or whatever it was, I will hear that. Um, and then that becomes my sounding where I'm like, okay, I need to repeat that. And that's the other thing too, is you have to be willing to repeat stuff. Um, you know, people have to hear things like 10 times before they hear it, right? Like we we're so, you know, challenged in, in not doing that. So, um, so yeah, I would say that's the big thing. Find something to celebrate and celebrate it. Read the book. It's helpful to read the book. Um, <laughs> just gonna throw it out there. Um, 
find something to celebrate it and celebrate it consistently and then start that active listening exercise with your church and see what language they latch on to um, about it. And, you know, I think all, all of these phrases that we use today track back to some phrase from someplace else I stole. <laughs> you know, you can't do everything. So do something is the title of a book some guy wrote. I'm not sure I actually read the book. I just like the title. <laughs> and I used title. it in a sermon. It's a great title. And I used it in a sermon and somebody said, somebody said something about it. So I used it again two weeks later and somebody said something about it. And I'm like, okay, we're onto something here. <laughs> I would, I would get up from my chair and go get, and I can see where your book is on my shelf. And I wanted to hold it up in front of everybody, yeah. but I'm, I would, I'm so tangled in cords, but seriously, um, get the copy of the book from amazon.com. Um, it's, it's an easy read. It's a good read. I think each chapter has a series of questions for dialogue and for reflection. <laughs> And I think that's one of the strengths of it. We have churches in this conference that are using it as study, uh, as study material for um, just <laughs> study, but also with their leadership teams. And I'm recommending it to churches that are doing simplified accountable structure as part of their spiritual formation piece and their development and their skill building. Um, so it's you, called you guys, it's called Witness Your Why by Jeremy Scott. Um, you guys have had Jason Moore, right? Do his couple of times he's been he's yeah. worked in our conference for probably a decade now in one nice. he did my cover Pardon? he, he, did, he did the cover, cover. That, looked did. Like a, that looked like a jason moore cover <laughs> yeah and i did i didn't pay him for it so i just told him i'd plug him every time i <laughs> i called in a favor because I... okay so more questions here what do we got um so this question i believe ties in with the previous one i just asked it but it had to do with um, churches that are maintaining and surviving, how can we start moving forward again to be a vital congregation in our community? But I do think, Jeremy, you touched on a lot of that same thing. Yeah, I, I think wherever you are, you know, you, 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 have, you, you have to find a way to start with in a basis of hope. Because as, as people of faith, I don't know that we have a choice other than that. Right. Like, you know, I mean, we, we, we worship the guy who came out of a tomb, right? I mean, you know, you know, brought hope literally from hopelessness. Um, so, you, and, you know, so, so the hard, the most important thing is to start, start there is, and, and, and really find some, some, something, something good, whatever it is, again, no matter how small, and start there from, from a basis of hope. And then this, this whole process is, and this is something I've had to learn that I didn't know when I first started that I wish I did because I made a ton of mistakes when I was young and really impatient um, is the mantra, slow down to go faster. Yeah. Slow down, do it right. I don't know how many times I've worked with church planners. I've worked with, you know, existing church ministries that want to rush through this first part that never really get the clarity they need about who they are and what it is they're trying to do and just want to get to the, the next steps, the next step of actually, you know, doing stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. you will, you do need to do stuff. Like you can spend too much time. Like you can never get to the do stuff phase and that's not good either. Um, but if you haven't had some conversation and done some sort of active listening process or something where you've got some sort of language or some sort of seed that you're forming around, um, you know, it's just going to make things more painful down the road. And it's going to make, cause you're just going to go, it's going to be really hard to figure out which direction to go. So I, I think if I, if I ever, I'm not a tattoo person, but if I ever got one, it would be like, slow down to go faster. It would be like right here on my thing. It's like, <laughs> slow down, do the work. You, you would think as an engineer, I would know that. But for some reason that learning just went out of my brain um, when I got to ministry and I thought everything was just going to fall from the sky and be beautiful. Um, <laughs> rainbows but, and skittles. <laughs> rainbows and skittles. So we're, we're almost at, at the hour, but I will um, just check with Jeremy if you can stick around, if, you, if people want to stay around and ask more questions. I know other folks have to get on with some other things, um, but maybe you can stick around for another five minutes. Would that be okay? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm delighted that people are, are interacting. Um, so if you have a question, send it to us now, please. And uh, we'll get Jeremy to answer it. I will. I will say that really, for churches that are moving out of out of or moving through this COVID world, and thinking about what it's going to look like on the other side, um, a question that that came to me one time in, in deep reflection was, "Who am I now that I am no longer who I, who I once was?" And I think COVID has changed who we are, 
And I look back and go, oh, I used to be the person that did that, get in the car and drive all over the annual conference for hours. Now I'm the guy who sits in Zoom, you know, but, but even more, more at an existential level, you know, the church can ask itself, who are we now that we are no longer who we once were? Mm -hmm. This book will help to bring some definition to that um, of what, what kinds of questions to be asking and what kinds of things to be thinking about as they reimagine themselves as church in a new kind of a new world, a new reality. Yeah. Um, so and, and give your and give yourself permission to do that. Yeah. So I think is there another question, Cindy or mm -hmm. Diane? There is another question. Um, in moving through witness your why, what is the most difficult change you have found that need that they need to make to do that? Hmm. I think. Well, first, I want to back up to, to one thing. I want to respond to one thing, Gary, you just said. Um, the other day, uh, the gal who put our bulletins together for forever, and of course, we're not doing that. We haven't been doing it for a while. She, she came out. She's like, oh, yeah, I'm holding on to this one bulletin so that I can remember how we used to do worship. <laughs> and I'm like, I looked at her. I'm like, you burn that. and You burn it right now. Like, we're, like there's, <laughs> if it's important, it will come back. If it's not important, it won't. Like, you know, people will make sure we bring back the important things. And if it's not important, it just goes away. So you just gear it out now. Um, I think one of the things um, that, one of the biggest challenges is the mind shift set of um, people do sort of have this ingrained expectation that, you know, they have preferences about how church, preferences about how they think church should be. Um, and church is good or not based on how well it is meeting their preferences. Um, so moving people out of that mindset into a more um, shared and collaborative mindset where, you know, the important thing is how well are we fulfilling our mission? How well are we fulfilling our why? How well are we living out um, our values? Whatever words you want to use. Um, you know, how are we fulfilling our missions to make disciples for Jesus Christ um, is one of the harder changes to make. And again, I think this is again where celebration becomes the key factor in it. You have to help people learn and practice to feel good and excited about good things happening, even if they're not their preferred thing. Right. I mean, and so, you know, it doesn't matter that you are or not involved in, you know, whatever ministry it is, if there's ministry happening within the life of this community and good is coming out of that ministry and you are also part of this community, then you get to celebrate that with them. Right. And when good comes out of the ministry you do, then they get to celebrate that with you. Um, awesome. So I think helping people move into that large that space of thinking beyond just their own individual preferences and their own personal individual desires not that those are unimportant either um i mean they're often there for a reason um but that's not the only thing that's important and i think um but but again that that idea of giving people permission and opportunity to feel good about the good that is being done in your community is is kind of the secret sauce for getting people um out of that world well, we look forward to your next book. <laughs> Seriously, as, as it continues to build on this. And Jeremy, thank you yeah. so much for spending this uh, hour and a couple of minutes with us at the Susquehanna Conference. Um, really appreciate it. These are great, great questions. These were wonderful. So sharp people in this conference, man. You, and, you guys, you do all right. Can I ask? A lot, ask, of, people, oh, a lot of people ask. have been expressing their gratitude to you, Jeremy, and thanking you for, for your work too. Cindy, did you oh, have something? You. I just had one more quick question, which is oh. the technical question. Someone wanted to know, uh, what did you use for your live stream services, Facebook or some other other way? Oh, okay. Um, well, honestly, I have, I have documented a lot of what I have done um, on my website, jeremywilliamscott.com. Um, and so you'll find a lot of write-ups about um, what I did on a live streaming. We started fairly basic. We've gotten fairly sophisticated over the time. Um, but um, right now we're actually, we're using some dedicated streaming equipment hooked up to a service called Restream. Um, Restream, well, you stream to Restream and Restream streams to everybody else for you. 
Um, so we, we simulcast to Facebook and YouTube. Um, I will, you know, my, my one thing, thing about that is um, we did some surveys of our church and figured it out. If you're only going to broadcast to one, my advice is to broadcast to YouTube because a lot of people will watch church on their smart TVs and YouTube is far more um, supported on more platforms and they are much, much less likely to uh, shut you down for copyright issues than Facebook is. Yeah. Um, so if you're only going to do one, do YouTube. Um, yeah. And uh, if you want to use the service, use the service are great. Uh, but yeah, if you visit jeremywilliamscott.com, I've got write-ups on um, a lot of what we, a lot of different options that we've looked at over the time and that other churches have done. And then also just what we're doing now. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy, so much. Diane uh, Kinesny and Cindy Weaver and Nate Smith, who have been supporting this webinar. Thank you also for your time tonight. And thank you for everyone else. Um, we, we still, we went over time. We still have over 70 people who have hung with us. Uh, and awesome. again, you know, the, the accolades and kudos and appreciation coming through in the chat. I don't know that you can see all those and we lose them when we're done. But yeah. um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate it. And okay, that's it, everybody. Have a great week. Do you want to say something else, Jeremy? No, I just I oh. thank you, Gary. I appreciate you being here. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe someday I'll get to visit you all in person. That'd be nice. I don't think I've ever, I don't really ever jumped the border from Ohio when I was in Ohio all those years. <laughs> I don't know. I promise you, everyone, when we can, we will have you here. I, okay. I'm, I'm a Westerner, man. Ohio is East enough for me. I don't know. Maybe oh, you got, you got to come to Pennsylvania, man. It's, you can't stop with Ohio. Come on. <laughs> I make fun of Ohio all the time. So I, maybe I should. <laughs> you got to be careful. There, there are probably people who are right on the border, maybe. Um, but thanks, everybody. We appreciate you being here. Um, so we're going to close out the session. Jeremy, you can stick around for a moment if you want. And Nate, thanks for uh, helping us tonight.